What's up, everybody? Let's make some noise for Jesus real quick. Come on, come on. I can't hear you. Come on, come on. We're talking about King of Kings, Lord of Lords, my Savior, your Savior. Can we give it up for Jesus one more time? Let's go. Oh, y'all rowdy, especially you. I like you. You rowdy. I like it. Well, I, I am so excited to be here, man. I've been looking forward to it. Man, let's give it up for Pastor Craig and his wife. Come on, come on, come on. All the COTFC staff. Come on, come on. I am so blessed to be here. Just like Pastor Craig, I've been on a semi-sabbatical slash vacation slash getaway slash leave me alone trip too. And uh, <laughs> the entire month of July, I committed for uh, uh, the second time ever, but the first time really, because the first time I was gone, but I really wasn't gone. I kept trying to con run stuff and text stuff and see what's happening. But this time I totally uh, disconnected and disengaged, and I just was spending time with my family, my children and my wife, and just refreshing and allowing God to speak to me and just hanging out, man. My wife and I, we had such a good time. As a matter of fact, speaking of my my kids, my son is here with me today. Y'all give it up for my son right there. Man, I love him so much. There's so many amazing people. I got some friends in here. Tim and Renee are here. Y'all may not know them. Just clap for Tim and Renee. Y'all I just love them. I just love them so much. And I'm, I'm just grateful for being here. I believe there's a word for you today. I've been praying for you uh, ever since your pastor asked me to come. I cut my, my break short and I said, I got to be here because I believe I have an assignment today to minister to the hearts of God's people. I believe that God wants to do something extraordinary in your life, but there's something we've got to overcome that's going to try to kill it. And so I just believe that today is going to be the beginning of the rest of your journey um, with the Lord. Let's pray. God, just be with us today. Speak to me. Speak through me. Speak for me. Help me help your people for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read it in the message version. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible because Paul so profoundly, theologically, unpacks and explicates weaponry and tools against what I feel like is coming against us trying to kill our destiny, kill our future. Let's look at this. Paul says this. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given and then sink yourself into that. <laughs> Don't be impressed, uh-oh, with yourself. I knew what nobody going to say nothing to that. I'm going to say that again. Don't be impressed with yourself. Here comes the, the, uh, the left hook. Don't compare yourself. Oh, Paul, please don't do this. With others. What do we need to do then? Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your life. I'm going to read that again. I know I got some church people in here who get excited just about reading the word. I'm going to read it again. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given and then shut your mouth, stop crying, stop complaining, but I added that. But sink yourself into that. Don't you be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself to other people. Each of you must take responsibility of their own life to do their creative best with it. There is a killer on the loose. There's a killer on the loose in the church. In your life, there is a killer. And this killer is a cold-blooded Freddy Jason Stranger Things killer. <laughs> this 
killer has an innumerable body count. This killer is responsible for dead dreams. This killer is responsible for deceased destiny. This killer has taken millions upon millions of futures and laid them the rest. This killer kills every single day. And if I'm not careful and you're not careful, we'll be this killer's next victim. If you're not careful, you'll look up in 10 years from now, you'll have a life without completed anything. If you let this killer come at you, you'll look up from now and you'll have an excuses, excuses all in your heart and life filled with regret. Who or what is this killer? I'm glad you asked, even if you didn't ask me. I'm glad. I, I want to talk to you for a few minutes from the topic. Comparison kills. Comparison. Comparison kills. Comparison kills futures. Comparison kills destinies. Comparison kills faith. Comparison kills joy. Comparison kills marriages. Comparison kills families. It's desire. It's to knock away your perseverance while at the same time deactivating your unique and divinely distributed destiny. Comparison kills. And you can sit here and look at me like you looking all you want to look and I'm just going to look right back at you. And you can sit here and act like I'm not talking to you, but I know I'm talking to you because I'm talking to myself. You can sit here like I don't like like you don't identify with what it is, but you know. Let me let me let me show you. All the single ladies in here make some noise. If you're a single woman in here, make some noise. Lame. I'm gonna ask you to do it again. All the single ladies, if you're not ashamed of being single, make some noise. <laughs> But watch this. Let me help you. Let me show you how deadly comparison is. You were so excited about being single. Remember that time you were just so excited? I don't care if I don't get married. I am content with Jesus. All I need is Jesus. If all I got is Jesus, that's all I need. I don't need Boaz to come and find me. I don't need no man. I am good. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be so lost in the presence of God that he going to have to find me in God's presence if he want me. I am okay with just me, myself, and I, baby boo. I am okay. And you went to bed, and that was your spirit, and that was your resolve until you woke up the next morning, rolled over, opened up your Facebook app, and you saw this. Your best friend done posted a picture that her and her boo is engaged. Now, all of a sudden, comparison has called a switch to flipping your mind. And before you were okay, but now you lonely, you depressed, you ugly, no nobody want me, I don't, I'm going to be lonely my whole life. Why? Because comparison kills. All the fellas in here, I ain't left you out. Fellas, make some noise real quick. Come on, fellas. I knew y'all was going to leave me out the drama. Ask the fellas to make some noise again. Fellas, make some noise. Yeah. But fellas, y'all know what I'm talking about. Let me tell you something. You, at the beginning of this year, you said, you know what? I'm going to get my body together. I'm about to get these guns together. I'm about to get this washboard together. I'm about to wear tight pants and tight clothes too. I'm doing it. It is what it is. I'm about to eat right. I'm about to become a vegan, eat fake bacon, fake chicken, <laughs> fake steak vegetables and you worked out for two weeks <laughs> and you felt good about yourself you lost 2.7 pounds and your pants fit a little different and you're walking different <laughs> a 
and you went to bed feeling like a million bucks until you rolled over the next morning, opened up your Instagram app, and saw this. seven pounds, but you don't look like that. And all the confidence you had, all the tenacity you had, all the, the vigor you had and the grace you had has now been under attack because comparison showed you somebody else. Comparison kills us in ways many other things can't. Comparison kills our appreciation for our design. And as a consequence, comparison attempts to put us at odds against our designer. Because comparison attacks our design as a consequence of attacking our design. Comparison then puts us at odds against our designer. What do you mean, Pastor 83? I'm glad you asked, even if you didn't. We no longer appreciate the wisdom of God in making us who he wanted us to be. Comparison causes us to position ourselves as enemies of the sovereignty of God. And in turn, we exalt ourselves and we exalt our own wisdom as supreme because we start to bombard God with all of the reasons he gave somebody else too much while not giving us enough. You gave Dwayne too many muscles. He got way too many muscles. You didn't give me enough. Look at that marriage. My marriage sucks. There's, look at them, how happy they are. He just bought her a new house. And look at Karen. She's just so happy. Why am I so sad? Comparison. Comparison. I call it the Jacob effect. Y'all remember Jacob, right? Y'all remember Jacob, Abraham's son, Jacob. You remember Jacob? Jacob was a trickster. Jacob, Jacob was a thug. Jacob was, Jacob was a bad boy, but Jacob had a problem. He had an insecurity because of comparison. Pastor 83, how did you know? He felt like the only way he can get his ble the blessing from his father is by pretending to be his brother. As strong as he was, the only, he felt in his mind, the only way I'll get the father's love is by pretending to be somebody I'm not, I'm not. And that is the trick of the enemy and the trick of comparison. What is it, pastor? It is to get you to pretend your way out of purpose. It is to say, as long as, long as you're who you are, you are not worthy to be loved. As long as you have what you have, nobody's going to recognize you. You better speak up. You better be the loudest person in the room. You better walk around here like your stuff don't stink because nobody's going to notice you because you're small. I see you, Jacob. Jacob had to dress up as Esau in order to get the blessing from his father. But I'm here to tell you, the reason you may not feel like God is blessing you is because you're presenting God the pretend version of you. And God doesn't bless who you pretend to be. Comparison kills. I want to give you some context to Galatians 6 so you can respect the content. Because without context, you will not respect the content. As we look at the text for this weekend, we find the talented tent maker from Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, very sternly, theologically, robustly, and aggressively coming against a particular ideology that had crept inside of this particular fellowship in a city called Galatia. This particular ideology have caused these converts to be deceived in the reverting back to works-based living instead of grace-based living. They become so clouded and so enamored by their own standards and their own abilities that they began to devour each other by the self-righteous means of comparison. They started to compare each other's spirituality. Look at Sandy, I'm more spiritual than her. Look at Mike. 
I'm more spiritual. Look at that. They started comparing each other's maturity. Look at this idiot. They don't serve anywhere in church. I'm serving everywhere. I'm so sick of them. Why don't they serve? Why don't they just come and consume, 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 consume? I'm just giving, 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 giving. What about me, God? What about me? And so the church in Galatia started to devour each other. Remember, Paul opens up this argument and says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You fools, you idiots, he calls them. Who has bewitched you? And in doing this, they have become so overtaken with each other's lives that they're not faithfully able to live out their own. And I want to talk to somebody in here who's been so enthralled with other people's lives that you have not been faithfully able to live out your own. What do you mean, Pastor? This is the millennial generation. This is the social media-driven generation. And the mantra or motto of social media is basically this. Fall in love with a life that isn't yours. Fall in love with a marriage that ain't yours. Ooh, look at them. They're so happy. Ooh, look at Brangelina. Ooh, look at Jay-Z and Beyonce. Ooh, look at them. They're so happy. Why are we not happy like that? I hate you. <laughs> Fall in love with a marriage. Fall in love with a church that isn't yours. Ooh, all my YouTube Christians, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. What you mean? Why isn't my church like this? Why don't we sing like that? Why don't they preach like that? Why don't we have this service like, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? Why don't we go out, why, 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 Rather it should be why, 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 why. Because social media and our culture has taught us to fall in love with every other life except for the one God has given us. And I, I believe the Holy Spirit sent me all the way here from City of Truth Church off of 3500 East Meyer Boulevard in Southeast High School to tell you to be careful that you are not so consumed with a life you haven't been given to the point the one you have isn't being lived. What do you mean? While we're comparing ourselves to other people, we're missing that we have something to. You have somebody to touch. You have somebody to encourage. You have a life that God wants to show the world to. You have an aroma of Christ that God wants to unlock everywhere. That is the purpose of the gospel. He says, I want to put you in every nook and cranny of this culture so that I can unlock you and let the aroma of Christ arise from wherever you are so that people can smell how good I am. But as long as we are trying to be other people, there are places the aroma is not that they should be because people are where the aroma needs to be. Who am I preaching to in this place right now? room today make a careful exploration of who you are Paul says he so eloquently and strategically and theologically rebukes them he's so smooth with it he's so smooth with it he cuts them like butter they don't even know that they cut and he says I need you to explore who you are, which brings me to the first weapon and the first tool we have to fight against the spirit of comparison is this, know yourself. Everybody say, know yourself. know yourself. The first thing I want you to write down is the word identity. Identity. He says, make careful exploration of who you are. Who is you? Yeah, I said, who is you? Who is you? Who are you? I know you know everything about the Kardashians. I know you know everything about Kanye. I know you know everything about politics. I know you know everything about this. I know you know everything about the Wall Street Journal. I know you know everything about everybody else's business, but who are you? 
I know you want the top of the line marriage. I know you want the best job. I know you want the best seat. I know you want to look the best. I know you want to live the best. I know, I know, I know, I know. But who are you? Why is that important? Because people who know who they are don't have to compare themselves to feel significant. People who know who, you, who they are understand that their significance comes from God. And the more of the Father we come to know, the more of ourselves we come to know. There's a song by Luther Vandross that Beyonce and Justin Timberlake cover. The closer I get to y'all. Anybody ever heard that? Raise your hand if you ever heard that. The closer I get to you. The words are so powerful. You didn't know they was theologically sound too. The closer I get to you. What's the next phrase? The more you make me. See, same thing with God. God is like, draw near unto me, and I'll draw near unto you. Come closer to me, and not only will I reveal myself to you, will I, but I'll reveal yourself to you. Because a lot of us are content with knowing God and not knowing ourselves. But it's impossible for you to say you know God and not knowing you. Because the closer you get to God, the more you understand how much you need him. Oh, I didn't, I knew what nobody going to say nothing there because you think spiritual maturity is how long you read your Bible. No, spiritual maturity is how clearly you understand how broken you are. Spiritual maturity is how clearly you understand how much you need the gospel over and over and over every single day. Identity is an, a weapon against comparison. The closer I get to Jesus, the more about me I understand. And the more about me, I understand, watch this, the more about me I start to appreciate. What do you mean? Comparison tells you to hate the things God wants to use for his glory. The closer you get to, what do you mean, uh, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. You didn't ask, but I'm glad you did. The closer you get to God, the more you appreciate and understand why you had to be born in the family you were born in. The more you get close to God, the more you understand that the parts of your story you're ashamed of are the parts of your story God wants to use the most. The more you get closer to God, the more the stuff in your life that you're not proud of is the stuff the light of the gospel wants to shine through. Because the light of the gospel shines the greatest through bulk, broken bulbs. Somebody say, know yourself. You got to know yourself enough to know because the closer you get to God, you understand that all the time my dissatisfaction with where my life is and my dissatisfaction with the hand I've been dealt oftentimes always points to the dissatisfaction my heart has with God. Really, it's not about your life. Your life is just what you're taking it out on. Really, it's the fact that you're looking here and you're seeing what they have, how they had to grow up, who they had to be, and you're comparing their story with your story. But Paul says, no, know yourself. Then in Galatians 6, he says, make a careful explanation of who you are. Then he also adds this. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. Then he also adds this. Make a careful exploration of the work you've been given. It's in Galatians 6. So what's the second weapon we have against the spirit of comparison? Here it is. Own your assignment. Own your assignment. Own your assignment. Own you. One of the best ways to fight against the spirit of comparison is owning your assignment. It's saying, yes, you have something, but God has given me something. Because as long as we define success based on somebody else's assignment, you'll always feel as if God cheated you. We have to own our assignment. And here's my point. The spirit of comparison comes to kill our authenticity by simply magnifying someone else's productivity. What do you mean? Notice, watch this, notice comparison never tells you to peek behind the curtain and see process. Comparison always says, look at the end result. Look on the surface. 
Look at what they have. Look at who they are. Look at the marriage they possess. Look at the happiness they have. Look at the joy that they have. But you don't understand that behind the curtain of their joy is a story that God had to mend broken areas back together. And comparison wants you to see the miracle but not the work. Comparison wants you to see the product but not the process. Comparison wants you to see who they are but not what they were. Because comparison understands if it allows you to see what they were, you will begin to give God glory for who they are. And you won't covet where somebody else is because you understand the process God had to take them through for them to be where they are. Know yourself. Know yourself. Everybody say, know yourself. And Paul could have left me there, but he had to just hit me again. He said, know yourself. He said, own your work. Then he says, and sink yourself into it. Everybody say, sink yourself. No, 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 no. I didn't say it like that. Whisper it. Just, it's just like a thing you guys got to do. Just don't be ashamed. Come on. This is summer vibes. Summer vibes. This is fun. We're about to have some fun. Here we go. Ready? Sink yourself. Not S-Y-N-C. Not sink as in cell phone sink. But S-I-N-K as in let it, let it come around you. Let, him, let it embrace you. Everybody say it again. Sink yourself. Say it. Say it. Sink yourself. The next thing I feel is a, a weapon against the spirit of comparison is we got to learn how to be too busy with our own life to compare it to anybody else's. Everybody say, be too busy. That's what's wrong with us now. We don't got enough to do. You, know, you, gotta, you got too much time on your hand. How, how you got all that time on your hand and you got all those people in your family who don't know Jesus? Well, what do you do when you first wake up? Is it, is it check your email? Is it surf on social media to see what other people? How do you know so much about everybody else's life but aren't attending to your own? How are you coveting someone else's marriage while yours is falling apart? Be too busy. This is a social media age, and I'm coming to talk to my fellow millennials. Y'all know we got it bad. Our thumb ministry is bad. The thumb ministry, we are the bishops of the thumb ministry. Pastor, I'm the lead pastor of thumb ministry. Y'all know what that is? Just scrolling on social media, looking at other people's life, double tapping. But here's the thing. Here's the warning. Here's the warning. We double tap other people's life. Don't waste your life double tapping someone else's. Don't waste the glory God wants to get out of your marriage by coveting someone else's. Proverbs 4, 25 and 27 says, look straight ahead. Right? He says, fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked, people of God. Keep your feet from following evil. Why? Because your feet follow your eyes. When you wander into comparison, you've stopped looking at the right things. You ever just had the best day in the world? I mean, you had the best day. You, you talked to the enemy that you have at work. You didn't cuss him out in your head or nothing. You didn't say, you didn't say, right, you didn't say nothing mean to him. You know they were being passive aggressive with you, but you let it slide. You let it roll off your back like water on a duck. You knew, Lord, I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. Therefore, I cannot say what I want to say. And you had the perfect day, and you felt on top of the world, and you made the money you needed to make that day, and you were nice to your children that day, and you were speaking to your wife that day or to your husband that day and then you got home and your thumb ministry got active and you saw somebody else's life and immediately you said to yourself yourself said huh you said we suck as a pastor I'm guilty of that I'll look and I'll see somebody else's church I could I could have done amazing God's glory was in the place people got saved healed delivered set free but I'll open up the trusty thumb ministry and I'll look and I'll say I suck, my marriage sucks, my kids suck, everybody sucks. The dog sucks. And I'd be like, why couldn't, why couldn't my brother be Patrick Mahomes or somebody? Why, 
Why, why, you know what I'm saying? Like, why I'm stuck with these idiots and I'm just around here. And it's just, nobody else? Just me? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, you, know, you know how it is. My man right there. You know how it is. Sometimes, sometimes the enemy takes your mind and you just look and you just, you disregard what the Spirit of God did in your life. You disregard how much God has changed your heart. You disregard the fact that you used to be this, but now you're this. You disregard the fact that you love Jesus with your whole heart, and that wasn't the case before. You disregard the fact that all your children are healthy in the land of living, that no sickness has come near your dwelling. You disregard all of that, and you look at what somebody else is doing and what somebody else has and who somebody else is, and you say, I suck. Paul says, sink yourself in your assignment. You have an assignment, baby. You got something big God wants you to accomplish. You got something amazing that God wants you to do. You have something out of this world that God wants you to touch. You got somebody's life that God wants you to minister to. And God does not want you to disregard what he's given you by you comparing it to what he's given to someone else. And last but not least, go back to Galatians 6, 4 and 5. He says, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've given. Sink yourself into this. Don't be impressed with yourself. Ooh, Paul, leave me alone. Leave me alone because a lot of us sit in here and we don't compare ourselves to people we feel are better than us. A lot of our problem is we like to compare ourselves to people we feel are worse than us. I knew when nobody gonna say amen to that. I knew, I knew it, I knew it, but I got to say it anyway. The Lord told me to say it. That a lot of us, it's not this way, it's this way. It's like, Lord, look at this dummy. And look at me. God, I've been, I've been, I was born in the baptism pool. God, I'm like John the Baptist. I've been baptized with fire in my mother's womb. Like, I came out loving you. It is what it is. Like, God, look at me. Like, look how much I'm serving. Look how much I'm giving. Look how much I'm doing. Look at this. Look how better, look how much better I am than them. Look at it. Because insecurity says in order for you to be secure, compare yourself the other way. I don't want to find nobody who's better than me. I want to find people who aren't better than me so I can feel better about myself. But Paul says, don't be impressed with yourself. Anything you have and whatever you do is because the gift of God on your life. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. If, you have, if, if the only way you feel spiritual and worthy is by comparing yourself to someone who you think isn't, you're a Pharisee because they did the same thing to Jesus. On paper, the Pharisees were more spiritual than Jesus. On paper, they didn't eat with any sinners. They didn't use any unclean thing. They didn't do nothing on the Sabbath. They kept all the laws. Remember, that's what they kept bringing up to Jesus. Jesus ate with prostitutes and hoochie mamas, and he ate with crack addicts and drug dealers. He ate, he ate with all kind of crazy tax collectors and gangsters. He ate with all those people. So on the surface, they looked like the Pharisees were more spiritual than Jesus. But I'm so glad that God does not work like an NFL team and just look at the stat sheet. That God says, I see men how men don't see men. I don't look at the stat he says, I look at the heart. So he says, don't compare. Then he says, don't be impressed with yourself. Then he says, don't compare yourself with others. Each of you take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your life. Number five is this. Here it is. You ready? He says, don't compare yourself with others. He said, take responsibility over your life. The last thing I need to tell you that will help you against comparison, because I know all of us struggle with it, not just me, but you, is this. Put it up. Do you. Do you. Do you. I'm not talking about in a selfish way. I'm talking about, think about how life is so fragile. Think about how life is so fragile. Scripture says that life is a vapor. Translated literally means that life is a puff of smoke. 
You know what a puff of smoke is? It looks big and amazing right when you puff it. I wouldn't know because I don't really smoke. But anyway, and none of you do either, but you've probably seen somebody who's, but anyway. Yeah, okay, you, okay, all right, good. All right, all right, praise God. But, 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 but it's here for 2.5 seconds and it's gone. So the Bible says that's how your life is. Quick, just here today, gone tomorrow, here today, gone tomorrow, here today, gone tomorrow, here today, gone tomorrow. But we're so busy comparing our puff of smoke with other people's puff of smoke. And we're mad at God that our puff of smoke is smaller than somebody else's puff of smoke. But God said your puff is here today and gone tomorrow. And you need to focus on what you can do with that smoke and not somebody else's smoke. I'm going to tell you how fragile life is. We just prayed for a family, a dear family at this church who went to bed with their father, woke up, he was gone. You're looking at somebody who identifies with that. January 21st, 2005, me and my two siblings, my new wife who I'd just been married to for six months, who had just suffered a miscarriage. January 21st, 2005, we woke up, sent our parents off on vacation, my mother and my father, sent them off on vacation. The plane they were in was in the air for five minutes. After five minutes, came down, crashed, killed everybody in the plane. Me, I'm 20 years old. My sister's 15. My brother's 18. My wife, 18, who was just newly married to me, just had a miscarriage, shook the foundation of my entire family. And I was tempted at the beginning to look at everybody else's story and say, God, why did that have to happen to me? Why did you have to allow my parents to die so tragically and gruesomely? Why did you snatch them away? Why did you take them? And I was comparing myself, and it caused me to hate God. But I was in church every week, and I was, how are you, blessed and highly favored of the Lord? I'm so great. You know, God is so good to me, and I'm just so grateful for a living life, and just, it's so amazing. And then at home, depressed, taking medicine, drinking myself silly, trying to sedate my soul with drugs. that if I'm going to be used of God, I have to pretend instead of lean into the pain. But God says, son, I'm God. I didn't ask you which story you wanted. I didn't ask you which family you wanted. I didn't ask you if you wanted the miscarriage. I didn't I didn't ask you if you wanted your mother and your father to die and leave you and your sibling as, uh, siblings as orphans. I didn't ask you because I didn't need your permission. I didn't need your permission. He said, you know what? I do need you to trust me because I know exactly what I'm doing. Because in that moment, God had compassion on me in my tragedy. But he's God enough to see my future in that moment. And said, I'm going to use that boy to minister healing to so many people. He has to suffer through this pain and his family has to suffer through this tragedy. But I'm going to get the glory out of this. And all the while Satan was saying, no, he's not. Satan was saying, no, he's not. And Satan's talking to some of you too. Your marriage will never be fixed. <laughs> It'll never be fixed. You'll never overcome that infidelity. Never. You'll never overcome that divorce. You'll never overcome that abuse. You'll never overcome that miscarriage. You'll never overcome the death of your people. You'll never overcome the fact that you had to grow up without a father. You'll never overcome the fact that your mom didn't have a nurturing bone in her body, so she was hard and she pushed performance, but you don't really know love. You'll, you'll never get over that. That's what Satan's saying. God is saying, guess what, babe? 
I gave you a puff of smoke. And the beautiful thing about me is I'm the one that will never leave you nor forsake you. The beautiful thing about me is I came to earth and I lived a puff of smoke. (laughs) But the death I died was a death that broke the power of the puff of smoke the enemy wanted you to have. In other words, Satan wants to condemn you in your mind because he wants to shut you up about your story. But what did Paul say? Don't compare yourself to others. He said, don't compare yourself to others. He says, live the life that I've given you. Live it. John 10 says the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy but I have come (laughs) I have come to give you life and life more abundantly So there's somebody here right now, and we got time. This is the last service of the day. There's somebody here right now who's been battling, trying to rebuild the things in you that comparison has killed. I'm here to tell you that you serve a resurrecting God, that nothing that is dead will stay dead in his presence. That just like Lazarus, he'll call that dream to come forth. He'll call that destiny to come forth. He'll call that marriage to come forth. He'll call that grieving place in you to come forth. And he'll come and get you because of his reckless love. I want everybody to stand on your feet right now and just get in your best worship posture. Just lift your hands. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands. And just begin to worship him right now. Just worship the Lord. Hey, God. Hey, hey, God. Hey, God. Hey. I know that there's somebody who the Spirit of God is calling you, calling you right now to do something you normally wouldn't do. If that's you, I just want you either to step out in these aisles or you can come down here to this stage right now. I, I just know somebody's been yearning for a touch of the fire of God. And I believe that that fire is here. So I want you to be bold enough. Don't worry about who's on your left. Don't worry about who's on your right. All it's going to take is one person to say, you know what? Comparison tried to kill something in my heart, but God's going to give it back to me. I want to see you right now. If that's you, I just want you to come here. We want to pray with you right now. Just come here right now. Yeah, just stand right there. Just come here right now and stand in the front. There you go. There you go. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Come on, lift those hands up.
Just the voices. We're going to say it again. No shadow.
Oh, you missed what I just said. You missed it. Because there are boat believers and there are water walking believers. There are people who are generous with their stories and there are people who are reserved with their stories. There are people who act like they've never been through nothing and there are people who are crazy like Peter who know they got issues but still say, you know what, God, use me for your glory. So I speak that over your life. Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Wake up the ministry that's in us. Heal us from divorce. God, help us with our marriage. Help us to speak out about where we are in our marriage. God, help us deal with grief in a healthy way. Help us not allow comparison to kill our joy. Oh, God. Oh, God. Help us to understand that you died for us. You've made us worthy, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, God. Thank you, Jesus. Just worship him real quick. Just sing your own song to the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. oh. God's ushering in a new wave of worship in this house too. Come on, you got to open your mouth.
Amen. So we're going to get out of church late this morning. How many of you were touched by this word? How many of you were encouraged this morning? I want to pray over you this morning, Armand. Because I know that God, God's hand is on this guy's life. And we're the same age. I think you maybe look a little older than me, but we're the same age. And I'm just blown away at what God is going to do through your life. And I believe that this city is going to be changed through your ministry. So if you feel comfortable, would you just extend a hand as we pray over him? God, we thank you for Armor 83. We thank you for the City of Truth leadership team. God, I pray that anything they touch would it flourish. God, I know right now one of their greatest needs is they need a facility. Right now, Lord, they, God, there's, they've been told they can't have church certain weeks. It has become a lid on their ministry. So I pray right now you begin to just step up and provide for them in Jesus' name. You own the cattle of a thousand hills, that you're not stressed out by this need, that you are the God of resources, abundant, unlimited. So we pray that you go before him. I pray that you would raise up men and women, God, ca capable leaders to become disciples, Lord. I pray that they would reach not just the inner city, but they would be a church that plants churches and campuses to reach the suburbs, the rural areas, God. I pray that you would expand their influence, that anything they touch would it flourish for your glory, God. We thank you. I pray you would give armor, wisdom beyond his years, leadership beyond his ability. I pray that your anointing would be so great. It would be poignant, Lord, just like this morning, that when he just preaches, it would pierce hearts, Lord, like arrows, that it would draw sinners to repentance, God. We pray that you would continue to use him, God. Give him clean hands and a pure heart for the glory of your kingdom. We thank you for his ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for this guy one more time. I want to just say one more thing. And I want to connect the dots from what I believe just happened. I don't think it's a coincidence that Armour spent an entire service challenging us to walk in our calling, challenging us to decipher and identify our specific assignment. And then he skips the space and talks about what's to come. So here's the challenge for where you are today. And here's what God's about to do in our church. He's about to open up a floodgate. Look around. What makes our church different is it doesn't look like any other church. So God's doing something unique here. And we're reaching a certain type of people. And I believe that God is about to blow that up. But let me, let me reveal to you the middle part. None of that will happen unless you people walk in your assignments. And what I mean, and that sounds, that sounds very stern and strong by you people. I mean, those of you who are the beneficiaries of the ministry, those of you who have been uh, consumers, but not contributors. I love you. This church loves you. But the thing keeping us from reaching our potential in ministry is we now need a new generation of people to step up and carry the mantle of leadership. And so the question as we leave here, the tension that we will not resolve, but we'll let, allow the Holy Spirit to resolve within you is will I walk in my assignment? Some of you, it'll be outside the walls of this church and praise God for it. But I think for many of you, it needs to start right here. Am I willing to let go of comfort? Am I willing to, to take myself on a journey of introspection to understand how God has wired me so I can use those gifts to reach a group of people where if they were to die today, they're gonna split hell wide open in our community. And does that bother me enough to actually do something about it? So that's what I wanna leave us with this morning. I received that word. Thank you for speaking that over our church. I believe that's in line with this is why we've been called a church for those who have given up on the idea of church. And so we need a different kind of person. Someone who's sacrificial, someone who puts the mission before comfort. And the question is, will we be that type of person? We're not gonna shut this down if you need prayer. Uh, we'll put some music on. We're gonna have our prayer team uh, work through. You can stay as long as you want. 
want to say one final prayer over us. God, we thank you for what you've done today. This will be a service that I will never forget. We thank you for AD3, City of Truth Church. God, just a kindred spirit. Lord, I pray that today would not just be an experience where we come and we get a taste of your presence. We come and we feel good about ourselves and leave this place all tingly and then we forget we go back to the normalcy of our day-to-day -day routine. I pray that today would be the catalyst to stir us onto what's next. Would you birth inside of us, would you plant a seed of desire, a seed that would just grow into obedience and sacrifice and discipleship, Lord? Would you help us walk in our calling? Give us eyes to see, hearts to discern, to know what you have next for us. God, for some of us, help us just get some skin in the game. For some of us, we've been through a season of healing, we've been hurt by other churches, but now it's time for us to get back. And we've used that excuse for far too long. We need to get back in the game. For others of us, it's just been under the, the guise of busyness. And I pray that we would let go of good things to make margin for great things in our life. Help us be the church that you are calling us to be in this city. We love you. We give you the glory for it. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, hey, let's leave this place realizing that we are now entering into the world's largest mission field. Amen. Love y'all. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.